Hello and welcome. My name is Mr. Gaffey and this is Gaffey's Grinds. This is video three in our series on trends of the periodic table. Uh, in our previous video, we learned about what first ionization energy means and what second ionization energy means. And in today's video, we are going to learn about some trends or we're going to look at some trends and patterns that we can see for ionization as we move around the periodic table. The usual warnings before you start watching this video, uh, Please try and eliminate any distractions. That means close tabs on your, on your laptop or your, uh, on your computer. And also try and remove distraction of your mobile phone. If that means turning it off, turn it off. Do not disturb something. Basically, don't let it disturb you. So turn it off, put it on, do not disturb. The other thing is uh, what makes our channel unique is that we break the topics down into really simple, uh, small, simple chunks, and then we give you loads of opportunity to practice. That's what makes our channel different from other videos. So if you're not gonna do the practice, then you should really go and watch a shorter video somewhere else. But by doing the practice, you are gonna learn, uh, you're gonna learn stuff much, much better. You're gonna retain it for a longer amount of time. I promise, uh, I promise that you will if you do all the, all the tasks. So it's really, really important that you do the tasks and don't just watch the video and skip past that. Otherwise you're really not gonna learn very much at all. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna quickly, before we talk about the trends in ionization energy, let's make sure we're, we all know, concretely know what is ionization energy. The best way to check that is by doing some questions. So these are questions from previous lessons, most, most of all from the last lesson, okay? So you have a diagram on the right here, uh, and that diagram is uh, important for question one and two. And then you've got two, three, and four are from, you know, general knowledge about the periodic table that I would expect you guys to know by now. And then uh, a definition, which you should really know word for word from the previous lesson. So I'm going to get to pause the video, try to do these questions now in full sentences, please, as best you can. Okay. So, uh, you will recognize this diagram from the previous lesson. I'm gonna stick the answers up now. What I want you to do is get a different color pen, a red pen, a purple pen, a green pen, different color from what you wrote in and make sure you make any corrections to your answers. Now you might have, have the exact wording of this, but you, you should have an idea if, it mean, if your answer means the same thing or not. If it doesn't mean the same thing, if you think my answer is an improvement on what you have, then you need to add bits to your answer, okay? So I want you to pause the video and make any corrections you think you need to right now. Okay. All right, just gonna just focus on one and two for a second, okay? Because they're a little bit more, I imagine that you did okay with three, four and five. Uh, question one, what does the red arrow show? So the red arrow showed the attraction that the outer electron has to the positive nucleus. As we can see, there's a red arrow, it's pointing inwards towards uh, the middle of the atom, towards the center of the atom where the nucleus is. We know the nucleus has all the protons and the protons have what charge on three, one, two, three? Speak your answer. Okay, I'm hoping that you said it has a positive charge. So if all the protons are here in the nucleus, that means that the nucleus is gonna be a positively charged area. And that means the electrons, because they are negatively charged, are gonna be attracted to it. We call this the nuclear charge. So the nuclear charge, because it's the charge of the nucleus. So the nuclear, because it's the charge of the nucleus, nuclear charge. That's what nuclear charge is, is where the nucleus, because it's positive, attracts the electron. What about the green arrows? Well, the green arrows show the electrons on the inside shells. Uh, so we've got electrons in the n equal to two shell here. So this is the n equal to two shell that I'm highlighting in yellow. Uh, this is the n equal to one shell. And then this is the n equal to three shell. Okay, so the electrons in the n equal to two shell, we call this an inner shell, repel the electron in the outer shell. So this is obviously the loosest bound electron, this one right here. And if it's the loosest bound electron, it's the one that could get lost first. And it is uh, repelled by the inside shell. So even though it's trying to be attracted towards the positive nucleus because of the nuclear charge, the electrons in the inner shells keep it somewhat repelled or pushed back. And what this does is it reduces the effect of the nuclear charge or what we call it reduces the effective nuclear charge. So the nuclear charge doesn't have as big effect when we've got this, what we call a screening effect. So the screening effect is the repelling of the outer electron by electrons in the inner shell. Okay, good. So hopefully you get that idea and you understand it. It's gonna be important for today. Uh, we're not just gonna forget about all that stuff. It all builds into the next stuff. Right, 
on to today. We're going to look at some trends now. Okay, so have a look at this table. I just want you to just take your uh, a little look at it for yourself there. All right, you might recognize the names of some of these elements. Do you know what group they belong to? So if you know what group they belong to, speak your answer on three, one, two, three. I'm hoping that you recognize that it shows the elements of group one. So these are all elements of group one elements. Group one. So it shows the elements of group one. And the first ionization energies for each element are shown here. Okay, and we're looking for a general trend or a general pattern. Okay, so they are listed in order. So lithium is the top element in the group. Sodium is the next element. Potassium is the next, rubidium and cesium. And so we're, this is we're moving, what we call moving down the group. Down the group. So as we move down the group, you can see that the first ionization energies decrease. Sorry about that now, decrease. So as we move down the group, the ionization energies decrease. We call this a trend, okay? Because it happens one after the other, it's a pattern. Okay, so it goes down and it starts at 520, then it goes down, down again, down again, down again. So it keeps doing the same thing over and over again. This is a pattern. Now, we have previously seen, when we looked at atomic radius, that if we if I represent the radius with circles here, we have previously seen that as we move down the table, the atomic radius also decreases. So if this is lithium, this one little dot here, this dot here, that's lithium. Then sodium has a very slightly bigger radius because we've added an extra energy level full of electrons. Potassium has another energy level added, so it is a bigger atom or a bigger atomic radius. Rubidium would be bigger again. And cesium would be the biggest in the group, or the biggest of these five anyway, okay? Now, because of this, one well, of the loosest electrons are further away from the nucleus because the loosest electrons are in the outer shell. So if they are further from the nucleus, then that means that the nuclear charge, they are further away from the nuclear charge. And if that's the case, if we remember, if we've got, for, say for example, we've got lithium, we've got the first shell. Lithium has three electrons. So it's got one in the first, two in the first shell, one in the second shell. There is lithium. Now remember, ionization means that we're going to remove this electron. This electron gets removed. Now to make that happen, we have to input energy. Now, the distance from the nucleus to that outer electron is quite small for lithium because the radius is small and therefore the nuclear charge is big. If I was to draw potassium K, oh, I'm just gonna change my pen color, sorry. If I was to draw potassium, I've got K, I've got two electrons in the first shell. I've got a second shell that's full, that's got eight electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got a third shell that's also got eight electrons. Like this, sorry, this is messy, but it doesn't need to be that tidy. And I've got a fourth shell that's got my outer electron. So as you can see, the distance now between the nucleus and the outer electron is much bigger. And also we've got a screening effect. So the nuclear charge is less, the nuclear charge is lower. So the, I still have to input energy to remove the electron. Input energy. But I don't need to input as much because it's less tightly held up. Okay, so let's just summarize. I'm just going to get rid of all of that because it's a bit of a mess. We're going to make a little summary now and then we're going to do some practice. Right, so we're going to state the general trend. So what is the general trend? Well, the general trend is that first ionization 
energy energy decreases down a group okay now we've only looked at one group here but it will be the same for any group because for every group as you move down the atomic radius is going to get bigger okay so it doesn't matter which group you choose we've only looked at one but it's going to be the same for any group so that's what we call the the general trend. So first ionization energy decreases down a group. Now, what are the reasons? Well, reason one is that the atomic radius increases. Radius increases. So what? what? Why does that matter? Well, it means that the loosest electron, which is the one that's going to get removed, is further from the nucleus, or what we call from the nuclear charge, which is what is really holding it in place. And the second reason is that we have an increased screening effect, increased screening effect. Now, the screening effect is increased because we've added more energy levels on the inside, which means screening effects will increase screen effect. Okay, uh, when we add extra shells of electrons uh, or inner shells of electrons, it they repel the outer electron and they uh, reduce the effect of nuclear charge. All right, so uh, what I'm going to get you guys to do is I'm going to get you to make a note of uh, what I have here. You don't necessarily need to take down the numbers or whatever. You just need to make a note of that. Okay, so you should only listen to my voice if you have made a note of the general trend in ionization energy down a group. Now, I want you to cover over them notes. You shouldn't be looking at that now while you do these questions. And we're going to do some practice. So here is some practice questions for you guys to do. So uh, you will see at the top of the screen, it tells you some keywords that you might want to use in your answers to these videos. Okay, so keywords are going to be shielding or electron shielding, nuclear charge, and valence shell. These are going to be important terms that you might use in some of your answers. They're just going to mean the quality of your answers is a bit better. So uh, I want you to take a look at the table, first of all. Have a look there for yourselves for about 10 seconds. Hopefully this looks pretty familiar because it's very similar to what we just did as if this is group two. So we've got group two elements and they're listed in order of going down the table. Okay, so I want you to pause the video and I want you to do questions, please. Okay, so you should only be watching if you have paused the video and you have done the questions. Here are the answers coming up. This is what you should have. So either tick it or fix it. So if you've got what I've written or if you've got something that means the same as that, then you can take it. Okay, so general trend, explain why you had to draw two atoms and then you had to explain why lithium's first ionization energy is higher than that, sodium's. So again, I'm not gonna spend too much time because I'm hoping it's pretty straightforward. We're explaining it pretty pretty simply and I'm hoping that that's okay. All right, so let's uh, let's, Go back to today's stuff and let's take a look at this table. So have a look there for yourself. What are we looking at? Okay. Okay, so looking at the table, it shows us the first ionization energies of the elements as you move across. And this is the second period. So a period is a horizontal row on the periodic table. That was in our first set of questions. I hope you knew that. Uh, the general trend is that the values increase as you move across. Uh, you can see this because if we take a look at lithium, which is at the beginning of the period, and we take a look at neon, which is at the end of the period, we can see the general trend. The general trend is that the number increases. This is what we call a general trend. So from start to finish, it increases. 
So the first ionization energy increases as we go across a period. And although we're only looking at one here, it is going to be the same for all the periods, and you will see that in future questions. Now, we've already seen that when we move across the period, the size of the atom, or what we call the atomic radius, is going to also, is sorry, not also, is going to decrease. So if we take a look at the second period, we would find that out of all of these, lithium's atom is the biggest. So lithium, beryllium is a little bit smaller. Boron is a bit smaller again. Carbon is a bit smaller again. Nitrogen, oxygen, getting smaller. Fluorine, and we're just going to look at neon is even smaller again. So that is the general trend as we move across the table. The, this is what we call the atomic radius. So the atomic radius decreases across the table. And why am I talking about atomic radius? I thought we're talking about first ionization energy. Well, this helps us to explain why. Why does the uh, first ionization energy increase across the table? Well, as we can see, if we take a look at neon, neon is in the same group or the same period as lithium. Neon and lithium are in the same period. But neon and fluorine, for example, are much smaller atoms, larger atoms. Relative to each other, there is a size difference. And that means that the electrons in the outer shell of the fluorine, so the loosest electron, loosest electron, is far away from the nuclear charge. Okay, so if we take a look at fluorine, we have fluorine, we have our first shell and our second shell is held tightly. So we've got seven electrons here. Uh, I think I've done one too many there seven electrons in the outer shell and they're held tightly they're attracted by the nuclear charge and then we have lithium that actually only has three electrons in its outer shell but the nuclear charge is smaller so it doesn't hold the electrons it doesn't pull them as tightly so lithium is actually a larger atom than uh, fluorine so uh, this means that the electrons are the loosest electron, I've said that wrong over here, Lit loosest electron is closer to the nucleus. Apologies about that, closer. I hope you spotted that mistake, closer to the nucleus. So if the atom is much smaller, the loosest electron is closer to the uh, nucleus and it's harder to remove. When the uh, atom is larger, like lithium, the... Um, the uh, ele loosest electron is far away. Now, if you're trying frantically to write down everything I'm, I'm doing, just stop, just listen, okay? I will summarize, we will summarize it in a second. Okay, so that is, uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, the first ionization energy increases across the table is because the atoms get smaller or the atomic radius gets smaller, which means the outer electrons are closer to the nucleus. What also happens as we move across the table is our nuclear charge increases. We learned this in our previous video as well. So our nuclear charge increases. And again, when we've got a stronger nuclear charge, we've got electrons in our outer shell that are more difficult to remove. So summarizing all of that now, I'm just going to get rid of the, the, the diagrams at this stage, and we are going to make a summary. Okay. So stating the general trend. General trend. Uh, the general trend is that first ionization energy
increases across a period. Okay, why? The first reason is that the atomic radius decreases. This means loosest electrons are closer to the nuclear charge. And this makes them harder to remove. And if they're harder to remove, you need more energy. That's why the first ionization energy is higher. The second reason is that as we move from left to right across the group, we increase the amount of protons in the nucleus without adding any extra screening. So we increase what's known as, we increase the effective nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge. So we would say that fluorine has a higher effective nuclear charge than lithium or than beryllium or than boron. So because it's over here, fluorine, and it has more protons in the nucleus without adding more uh, inner shells of electrons. It has a higher nuclear charge than beryllium, than boron, than carbon, and nitrogen. It has a higher nuclear charge than all of them. All right, it's time to do some practice. Okay, uh, here we go. All right, so as you see, I want to have a look, study the table here for a second. We have elements of period three. So similar to what we just looked at, except this is period three. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and I want you to try them for questions, please. Okay, so you should only be watching the video if you have answered, uh, if you would answer them for questions for me from memory without looking at your notes. Uh, and this is what we should have for the answers. Question one, first ionization energy across a period increases across a period. So the question there was, what is the general trend? Well, the general trend is across a period, first ionization energy increases. The reasons for this are the, the atomic radius decreases and the effect of nuclear charge increases. I've also put in brackets, you could say, instead of saying effect of nuclear charge, you could say the nuclear charge increases with no increase in screening. But together, these things, two things combined, when you get an increase in nuclear charge, more protons without any extra screening, we describe that as the effect of nuclear charge. Number three says, write the configurations, electron configurations for sodium and argon. Okay, so we got to do that now. So again, it's a little bit of recall, but it is going to be related to what we're doing in the next little section. So we've got sodium is Na. Sodium has 20, oh, sorry, 11 electrons, 11 electrons. So we start filling our energy levels. Our first energy level is the 1s and it's 1s2, it's full now, 2s2, 2p6, that gets me to 10 electrons, and then I've got 3s1. If you have no idea what I'm doing, then you need to go and watch the video on uh, how to write electron configurations. The other one that we had to do was for argon, AR. Okay, argon has 18 electrons, 18. So argon's configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Well done if you got that right. Fluorine has a smaller atomic radius and a higher effect of nuclear charge than boron, which makes it more difficult to remove electron. So as you see here, the question was explain why fluorine's first ionization is energy is higher than that of boron. There are the reasons why fluorine has a smaller atomic radius and a higher effect of nuclear charge than boron. Okay, uh, we're going back over. So again, so that's what makes this channel different from others, small bits at a time with practice and then we build on that, okay? Now, some of you more eagle-eyed students may have noticed that in this table above, we had the general trend that we described. The general trend is that from left to right on a period, like this, we have 
and increasing first ionization energy. It increases. But some of you may notice that there was a couple of exceptions in this trend. Okay, so if we zoom in and look at, for example, um, boron and oxygen. And take a look at these boron and oxygen. Now, if you take a look, we said the general trend is that we have an increasing first ionization energy, but boron is lower than beryllium and oxygen is lower than nitrogen. So those are exceptions, they break the general trend. Now, this can be better viewed with the help of this particular graph. So I just want you to have a look at that graph again by yourselves for a couple of seconds. Okay, the areas that we're interested in that we looked at above were from beryllium to boron like that, and from nitrogen to oxygen here. They are the areas we're interested in. But I just wanna highlight that look, it also happens in the next period. Magnesium to aluminium, there's a decrease again. And phosphorus to sulfur, there's not an increase. It stays about the same. Now you can still see, if you look here, I'm gonna draw in a different color. I'm gonna draw in orange. You can see the general trend, the illustration of the general trend. From lithium to neon is a period. And as you can see, the general trend is that the ionization energy increases. Remember when we're going up, the ionization energy is increasing. So the general trend is it's going up, but we do have these purple circles where there are exceptions to the rule. Now to understand what's going on, we're gonna to need to have a look at these two questions. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and I want you to do these questions now, please. Okay, so you should only be watching the video if you have done these questions. I'm hoping that you've already watched the videos of this stuff so you know how to do it. So you should have watched these before you did this. Uh, so electronic configurations of beryllium, boron, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon. Okay. Now, we've got beryllium, BE. The electron configuration of beryllium looks like this. 1s2, 2s2. So beryllium's only got four electrons. Boron, B, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Boron has five electrons. So as we have seen uh, from the configure uh, from these configurations, if we then look at the electron spin diagrams that you would have drawn for these, you would have had the spin diagram done for beryllium. You were asked to do that here. So the spin diagram here is where we draw the uh, electrons in the orbitals. So if this is the one s orbital, we've got two electrons, one up and the one downspin, and this is the 2s orbital. It can hold two electrons. We've got one that spin up and one that spin down, like that. That's the four electrons. And there's no electron in the next energy sublevel, which would be the 2p sublevel. If we, you know, I didn't ask you to do the spin diagram for boron, but if we were to, this is what it would look like. Two electrons in the 1s, two electrons in the 2s, and one electron in the 2p. Okay, now as you can see, the beryllium has its loosest electron. It's one of these, it's either that one or that one, but we don't know which one it is, but its loosest electron is in a full sublevel. Level, sorry, a full sublevel. So the 2s sublevel is full. Whereas the outermost sublevel of boron, the 2p, has only one electron here. Remember, a 2p sublevel has three orbitals. So this is 2px, 2py, 2pz. So that sublevel can hold six electrons. So it's definitely not full. It's only got one electron in there. 
Now, when we have sublevels that are full, like this one here, the 2s sublevel, or when we have electrons which are half full, then they have this increased stability. So if you've got a completely full sublevel or a half full sublevel, there is an extra stability, which means that there's a specially high amount of energy required to remove an electron from that configuration. So as B beryllium has a completely full outer sublevel, its ionization energy is particularly high. This means that this helps to explain why there's a dip up here to boron. There's a dip to boron because beryllium's uh, first ionization energy is abnormally high. It's a little bit higher than we would expect because of this full 2s sublevel. Okay. Now, likewise, if we look at N and O, we're going to write the electron configuration for them here. This is N. Nitrogen has seven electrons. So it's got this configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And if I was to draw the spin diagrams, I would have this here, a full 1s, a full 2s, one up and one down. And I would have the 2p, which is 2px, 2py, and 2pz. And remember the rules for filling the electrons, we fill them one at a time. So the three electrons go into separate shells. We say that this here is a half full sublevel. And it's extra stable. Now it's not as extra stable. This is super extra stable. A full sublevel is super extra stable. Okay, so full sublevel is super extra stable, whereas a half full uh, sublevel is extra stable versus one that just has just the odd electron in it. Okay, so because this is extra stable, it requires an unusually amount, an unusually high amount of energy to remove an electron. So we see this as like a, a raised value or what we call a little spike in value. So that's what we see when we move from nitrogen to oxygen, we see a dip. And a dip that we see is because nitrogen had this abnormally high first ionization energy because it's got a half full sublevel. So nitrogen has a half full sublevel. Oxygen just has an odd electron. It's got four electrons in the 2p sublevel. That's not any special stability. It's just four in there. It's not, it's not half full, it's not full. So, you know, it, it doesn't have any extra stability. So nitrogen actually requires a super high extra amount of energy to remove the outer electron. One more thing that's worth noting is that electronic configuration of neon. Neon. Neon is what we call a noble gas. It belongs in the group eight of the periodic table. It's a noble gas. And if we think, if we look at neon's uh, uh, electronic configuration, it has 10 electrons. So it's got two in the first energy level, 1s2, then it's got 2s2, and then it's got 2p6 like this. Now, if we draw the spin diagram for this, which you should have done already, we have two in the first shell, spin up, spin down. We have two, uh, so this is the 1s. In the 2s orbital, we've got two electrons like that. In the 2p sublevel, we've got three orbitals, one, two, three. Uh, this is 2px, 2py, and 2pz. And we've got two electrons in each orbital like this. This is what we call a full energy level. The second energy level, n equal to two, is full. This is a full 
energy level. So just go back and summarize again. This was a full sublevel, the 2S sublevel. This was a half full sublevel, three electrons in the 2P sublevel. This is a full energy level, the whole N equal to two. So two here and two here. There's eight electrons in this energy level. There's two in the 2S and a six in the 2P. So in the N equal to two energy level is full. So I said that this was uh, extra stable. So extra stable for half full. I said um, the full sublevel was super extra, uh, so uh, extra stable. And now I'm saying the full energy level is extremely extra stable, extremely extra stable. I'm trying to uh, explain this as simply as I can. So that's why I'm using words that might not be the most scientific but we build the scientific language afterwards. So extremely extra stable. So this is the most stable, if you hadn't got that idea already, the most stable. And this is why we always talk about the octet rule and how electrons like to have a full outer shell. This is because it's the most stable configuration. So this takes extremely high amounts of energy to remove an electron from this configuration. It's not impossible, but it takes a hell of a lot of energy. So when you look at the uh, first ionization energies for the noble gases, any of these, neon or argon, these tend to have very, very high first ionization energies. Okay, all right, it's time to do some more practice now. So over here, uh, is it this one? No, here we go. All right, so I want you to pause the video and I want you to do questions one to four first for me, please. Okay, so you should have done questions one to four. You should only be listening to me now if you've answered questions one to four. Uh, before we do question five, I just want to go back to this graph for a second and point something out to you guys. So take a look at this graph. I'm just gonna clear it here. Um, Okay, now, as we learned in our previous lesson, uh, elect uh, atoms can lose electrons in what we call the first ionization to become a monopositive ion, lithium, plus uh, an electron. They can then lose a further electron in a process known as second ionization energy. So I wanted to speak your answer to the screen. Now, what will the equation look like for the second ionization here of lithium? Okay. So I'm hoping that you said something like this, Li plus to give you Li2 plus plus an electron like this. Now, if we take a look at lithium, lithium is here. Now what this graph shows us is that for the first ionization, the energy to remove the first electron here is very low. 500 kilojoules per mole. But if we think about it, lithium, or this Li plus here, sorry, this should be an Li plus, I forgot to write this the first time, will then have the same configuration as which element? Speak your answer to the screen on three. One, two, three. You should be able to figure it out. If you don't know, have a look at the graph again. Or will have the same configuration as then? One, two, three. Okay, I'm hoping that you said it has the same configuration as helium because helium has two electrons. Lithium has three. So if lithium loses one, then it then has the same configuration as helium. So essentially it becomes like this, the electronic configuration, helium, which means that if I wanted to do this, take to the second ionization energy, I would expect this energy to be much, much higher because you'd be taking this second electron of lithiums from a full energy level. So helium has a full energy level. Helium's electronic configuration, HE, it just has two electrons. So it's 1s2. It's two electrons are in the 1s or uh, energy level. It's 1s2, it's full. 
This is a full energy level and this is a very stable configuration. It takes a lot of energy to take another electron from here. So we, I would expect the second ionization energy to be much, much higher for lithium than the first one. When we know things like this, it would be the same if I took a look at sodium. The first ionization energy is very low, but the second ionization energy, it would then be like neon and it would be much, much harder to remove a second electron. That would be called a second ionization energy, be much, much higher. Then it would be steadily around this, you know, steadily decrease. And then it would be more like lithium and you'd see this big spike again. So the idea that I want to get here is you can use these to predict what group an element might be in. So if we go back to our questions again uh, and take a look at this table, this is what our table number five has. So take a look at the table for yourself for a second, examine it. Okay, so as you see, we've got four different elements. Sorry, that should be A, B, E and D. Like that. Apologies about that now. That should. Okay. And you're given the first four ionization energies for each one. So for A, this is ionization energy one, that's two, that's three, that's four. So what you have to do for part A is to identify which group they belong to. So take a look at the patterns in the ionization energy, figure out what group they belong to. That's quite tricky. And if you can do that, I'll be very impressed. Okay. Then you've got a couple more questions to answer on them. So you're really going to have to have a think about this, have a think about the ionization energies and have a go at working on them. Okay, so pause the video and do that now. Okay, so this is what you should have, guys. Okay, so uh, if we take a look at the table, uh, if we watch the pattern, for A, first ionization energy, 500, pretty low. Okay, 500 is pretty low compared to some of the other numbers. We then have this massive spike or this massive jump in ionization energy yeah. for the second ionization energy. What that tells me is that this moving from here to here is going to a new energy level because there's this massive spike in, uh, in, in first ionization. So that means after we remove the first, uh, the first electron was easy, the second electron was hard. That tells me that this must be in group one. So if you say group one, well done. Okay. Uh, B, if we look at the pattern of B, B has 740 as its first ionization energy, then 1500, that's still quite low compared to this. This is a big spike in the third ionization energy. That tells me the first two were pretty easy. And then we got to a new energy level. So that tells me that there was two electrons in an outer energy or an outer shell, and then we started a new shell. So it must be group two. Well done if you said that. C is a similar pattern. We've got 900, we've got 1800, and then we've got a massive spike to 1400, 14,800. So again, two electrons were easy to remove. So that tells me there was two electrons in the outer shell, and then we went to a new energy level. So it must have been, if there was two electrons in the outer shell, it must have been in group two. D then has 580, and then 1800, it's higher, 2700 higher, but then bang, there's the spike, 11,600. So there were three electrons in the outer shell, easy to remove, and then we got to a new energy level, group three. Well done, guys. That was quite tricky, so well done if you got that right. Okay, uh, B, uh, which of the following elements is most likely to form an ion with a plus one charge? Give a, uh, give a reason for your answer. Well, if we take a look here, this is the one with the lowest energy. So this is the one that's easiest to take an electron off. So we're being asked, which of the elements is most likely to form an element with a plus one charge, which means it's easiest to lose the electron. So to me, that's element A. So element A is the one most likely to form an ion uh, with charge of plus one because it has the lowest first ionization energy. So it's the easiest one to take an electron off. See which two elements are in the same period or in the same group, sorry, and which group they do they belong to. B and C are both in group two. That's what you should have said. D, which element would require the least energy to convert one mole of gaseous atoms into ions carrying two positive charges? This one was very tricky. Uh, so if we wanted to convert atoms, 
So there's key here, one mole of gaseous atoms. That means they started as neutral. And we want to convert them into ions carrying two positive charges. That means they have to do two ionizations. So we want to know which one would require the least amount of energy to do two ionizations. So to work that out, you would need to add up the, the first ionization energy and the second ionization energy for each one and figure out which one of those would have the total highest energy for those two, or the total lowest energy for those two ionizations. So if we take a look at element A, it's got the lowest first ionization energy. I'm just gonna rub that out again. It's got the lowest first ionization energy, 500, but its second ionization energy is quite high. So that would be difficult, uh, reasonably difficult. The total there will be 5,100 joules to do two ionizations. The second one is 740 plus 1500. That's 2200, so much lower than A to do two ionizations. The next one is 900 and 1800. That's 2700 altogether. That's higher than B, but lower than A. And the last one is 580 and 1800. Total there is 2380. So the easiest one to make do two ionizations would be element B. So if you got that right, well done, that was, again, that was quite challenging. All right, last little bit for today, last little bit of a trend that we're going to take a look at is this graph here. Now, before we do, we're gonna be looking at something, uh, ionization energies for potassium. Before we do, I want to pause the video and write the SPD configuration of potassium and draw a bore atom of potassium. So pause the video and do that now. Okay, so potassium is K, and you should have it 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3, sorry, 3s2. There's 19 electrons all together. So, so far I've got 10, 12. Uh, I've got 3p6, that gives me 18, 4s1. That's the configuration. And if I was to draw a bore atom, I would have potassium nucleus, and then I would have two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell, eight electrons in the third shell, and one electron in the fourth shell, n equal to four. Now, what this graph shows us here is what we call successive ionization energies for potassium. So instead of just doing one ionization energy, where you keep taking more and more electrons uh, and you measure the energy it takes to remove each one. Now, as you can see, the general trend is that it takes more and more energy each time you remove an electron. Okay, so it takes more en the energy required to remove an electron increases each time you do an ionization but there are some interesting observations. First of all, the energy required to do the first ionization here. And I know that this is the first because this is one electron removed. So electrons removed is on the X axis here, and this would be one. The, the ionization energy to remove the first electron is, is, is low. It's the lowest out of all of them. It's the easiest electron to remove, the outer one. And that should make sense to you if you think about the atom, imagine, picture the atom, and we've drawn it up here, it's this one. This is the first electron to be removed. Why is this one the easiest? Well, this is, is the atom is at its largest stage here. So this, uh, this is in the fourth energy level, n equal to four, it's far from the nucleus, and there is three inner shells of electrons to screen. So that's why it doesn't take much energy, it's easy to remove. Okay. But if you notice, there is a distinctly large spike. A spike is basically a big increase. There is a distinctly large spike to the second ionization energy. Well, why is that? Well, this is because we're now moving into a inner shell. We're moving into the N equal to three shell. We've already removed the electron in the N equal to four shell. Now we have to take one of the electrons in the N equal to three shell. And these are harder to remove because this is a full shell. We've got extra stability. So this is 
the first electron in n equal to three, and it's a large jump in energy. We then have, we'll notice eight values for electrons that are steadily increasing. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, and then what do we see? We see another spike. Okay, and then what do we see? Eight more, and then a spike. And then we see two final ones, which are around the same. So the general trend is that it increases, but some interesting observations. Every time we get to the end of a shell and we are end of an energy level and we have to move into one of the inside energy levels and we have to take an electron from a full shell we get this big spike then we have exactly eight values which are just steadily climbing and then we have a jump again so this here is often used as a, this observation is often used as a major piece of evidence as proof that energy levels do exist remember when we were studying the, the atom, the model of the atom, we know how small the atoms are. It's very hard to study them. It's very hard. We can't see electrons and protons and neutrons. So we have to use data that we do have to try and figure out what it's like in there. So this piece of evidence here, the fact that you can measure these ionization energies and that this is the pattern you get, this is what helps scientists to figure out the fact that there are such things as energy levels. Now we know that the Bohr spectra gives us another piece of evidence. The fact that there's only distinct lines and electrons can't have just any energy they want. They have only specific, they can only uh, hold specific values for energy. That's definitely proof that energy levels exist, but this is further proof. The fact that there's exactly eight electrons in this little section here, exactly eight. Well, that kind of coincides with the idea that as, uh, each energy level can hold eight electrons. And the fact that it, there's these big spikes then would tell us the fact, it would give us information that full energy levels are extra stable. Okay, so again, we're going to just do some more practice on that. That's the best way for me, uh, for you guys to check whether you actually understand what we're talking about. And we've got the last set of questions for you guys to practice. And this is them here. Just going to change the wording of that. This should say ionization energy. So you've got the first ionization energy for helium and for, uh, for neon. So you've got two values. And you've got to use atomic structure to explain why do helium and neon have these very high energy ionization energies. So these are distinctly high compared to some of the other numbers that we've seen that are in the low hundreds, 200, 300, 400. These are well over 2000. So these are much higher than your regular. That's question one. So just pause the question, the question one and do question one for me now. All right, this is what you should have for question one. The loosest electrons about helium and neon are found in energy levels that are full. So they're not easy to remove. So this is a very stable electron configuration and it takes a large amount of energy to remove an electron from this arrangement. So they both have full outer shells takes a lot of energy to remove an electron from this configuration or this arrangement. We then have some questions about magnesium. So we've got the first, second, and third ionization energies for magnesium are plus 737, plus 1450, and then plus 7731. So first of all, write out the electronic configuration for magnesium. You should be able to do that and draw a spin diagram. Then you have to explain why there is a sharp increase or sharp rise between the second and third ionization energies of magnesium. And then you have a question on lithium. So I want to pause the video and do those now, please. Okay, so you should only be listening if you've done those. First of all, uh, for lithium, uh, for magnesium, the configuration is Mg. And you've got, in magnesium, you've got, I think it's 12 electrons. Yeah, 12, you've got one S, one S2, two S2, two P6, and three S3, three S2, like that. Spin diagram looks like this. 
You can forget the inside shells. We're only interested in this. The 3S2, we've got one spin up and one spin down. This is the 3S uh, energy uh, orbital. We're not interested in the inner shells. We're just interested in the outer ones. Right, it then asks you for um, explain why there's a very sharp rise in uh, between the second and third ionization energies of magnesium. Well, the sharp rise is due to the fact that the third ionization is removing an electron from a full energy level n equal to two. So once you remove this one and this one, these are the two outer shells, then you're into a full energy level. So this n equal to two has eight electrons in it. And that is a full energy level. So hopefully you said something like that. This configuration is very stable and requires a lot of energy to remove this electron. The last one ends about lithium. Lithium has three ionization energies. Between which ionization energies would you expect to see a significant increase in ionization energies? Well, if you think about lithium, it's got two in the first shell. It's got one in the second shell. So if you take that one electron in the first ionization, then ionization, then the second ionization energy would be removing an electron from the inner shell, which is full. And this is the one that's going to be very, have a big jump. So between these two values, there's going to be a large jump, a big jump, because the second ionization is coming from a full energy level. So between the first and second ionization energies, we'd expect to see a large increase. All right, guys, there's a lot of stuff in this video, but I'm hoping that we broke it down small enough into small pieces for you guys to understand it. If you think this video helped you in your understanding of this particular trend, please do give the video a like. It'll help other students uh, to find it who might be struggling and who need to practice. Uh, and that is uh, first ionization energy trends. In the next video, we'll be looking at trends in electronegativity, which is another pattern we can spot in the periodic table. And uh, I look forward to seeing you. See you in the next video.